Tottenham in North London on a quiet Sunday in May. It's time to go to church for Douglas Mullings and his family. The 32-year-old carpenter notices someone has bumped his car. This leads to an argument with the local street gang. The encounter ends with a masked gunman blowing apart the back of Douglas's head. When Douglas was taken to hospital, it was decided quite quickly that he should be protected by armed police officers. He'd been attacked by incredibly violent people. I thought there was a very good chance that these people might wish to go to the hospital and cause him further harm in order to stop him from uh, speaking out. Normally we're a, a murder investigation team and it's very unusual for us to take on an attempted murder. That's usually the, uh, the shootings team's job. But in this instance, I think that the opinion was, which I suppose is wrong, is that uh, he's so severely injured or so critically injured that he won't survive. Hello there. I'm from Trident. Trident is an elite unit focused on black-on-black -black gun crime in London. To reassure the local community, a murder team takes the case. We're examining Meridian Walk, which is a, a walkway into this little housing estate. And by a great stroke of luck, there is um, CCTV there that we think have caught most of the incident. The tape shows a stolen gold Mercedes bumping into a parked blue Honda. Its owner, Douglas Mullins, goes up to the occupants of the Mercedes. The driver, wearing a distinctive black and white hat, confronts Mr Mullins. Well, we also have many witness statements from people who have witnessed this offence from the beginning. They have told us that the man who was arguing with Douglas is called Sykes. This is Douglas here with the green top and the blue trousers. He's come up and he's talking and Sykes straight away is straight up close to him saying, well, you know, what's wrong, man? You know, he's just driven his car into his and it's not his fault. Douglas has stood up to him and said, hang on a second, you know, what are you going to do? How are you going to pay for my car? Natalie, his daughter, has witnessed this all happening. They felt that there were big men around Meridian and how dare we ask them what happened to my mum's car. My mum was just trying to get to the bottom of it and that's when immediately they said, we spoke to your old man about it and we dealt with your old man and basically he's a dead man, he's a dead man. You know, there was no reasoning with them because at that, at that time they're not rational. You know, they just hyped up delinquents and they just wanted to start trouble that day and they did. You can see all the ewes just lining up around him, circling him, circling like sharks. You can feel the aggression just bubbling away. They armed themselves with blinds, with pieces of wood, with bricks, and they're just charging, you know, and we stood our ground, and that's what they didn't expect, us to stand our ground, because at the end of the day, they thought they could make us, you know, run away. Uh, Douglas has been hit by several things that have been thrown. There was um, bricks found in his house all along his corridor. Then he's got hold of a long knife, obviously because of his fear, he's then chased these people around. I believe that was the time when they made that fateful call and said, yes, we're going to sort this out our way. Sykes was seen on his mobile phone and that he's actually um, been heard to say, bring your peace. And I tried to explain to my mum that means a weapon of some sort, either a gun or a knife. And I think we better just go because it's not, this is not, you know, something that we're used to, let's just go. Witnesses have told us that the gunman was brought to the scene in a Red Rover. He's got the shotgun on his right-hand side, but he also has a black bandana covering the lower part of his face. He has run from Commercial Road to Meridian Walk and stopped outside number 57, where Jennifer and Douglas were. Douglas was just stepping into the house, and there was a gasp. <gasps> And that's all I heard, and I thought, what's that? And I turned around, and I saw somebody lean over, and something just lift up, which was a gun, and I just turned around. I just heard, chuk, chuk, bang. <laughs> Mum started a lot of crying and wailing, and, you know, our brother standing there seeing this strong man just there on the floor. What happened to my daddy? What happened to my daddy? Crying. And we're telling him to go, and he's not going, and he's just standing there like he's in shock. And then I'm trying to speak to the police to get the ambulance to come here. 
and I remember the lady saying move away from that hysterical woman because I cannot hear what's happened. As Douglas is rushed to hospital, paramedics fight to save his life. With a hole in his skull the size of a cricket ball, they think he won't last more than an hour. His loss of blood alone should have killed him. As we took the bandage off, it was apparent that there was a lot of brain and dead matter and bone fragments coming out through a large irregular wound in the right side of Douglas's head, approximately here. And we can see that there is a gap in the bone where the bone itself is actually missing, having been blown out by the impact from the shotgun wound. And this sideways view of the skull shows little round pellets. They hit the skull somewhere around about here. Some passed through the skull, literally blowing fragments of bone outwards, and one or two passing then inside the skull, with one in particular lying right in the middle of his brain. After surgery was completed and Douglas was taken to the intensive care ward, I then met his wife for the first time. I had no choice but to tell her how serious the injury was and the fact that we had no means of knowing if he would survive from this injury. At the best, I suggested to her, she might have to accept that he might never regain consciousness and if he did, that he might be permanently paralysed down the left-hand side and unable to communicate with her. At the scene of crime, parts of Douglas's head remain on the floor. And how awful must that be? That you've got somebody at your feet who you love, obviously, who's got a hole in their head and they're bleeding to death at your feet. It just shows more quite how bloody and how awful a shooting is, really. It's not quite a clean thing that you see on TV with nice round holes. It's this. And these are the sort of people who are trying to catch. As we've left the, um, the holes, there were the pellets of hit from the shotgun charge, but the tape is, you can see the holes. The ideal was we, we'll get the gun and try and put it back and try and match it to the actual shot that's here. Trident hopes these patterns will help identify the shotgun that was used. While the search for clues continues, the close remains cordoned off. Only residents are allowed in or out. Ironic that my neighbours and the friends that live around there said that since this has happened and it's so, so sad that they've had some peace, that people can sleep at night when it's quiet. But it took my husband to get a bullet in the head for that to happen. And I'm very angry. Some of the youths who fought with Douglas are in a local gang called the Meridian Crew. Over the last four years, they have caused trouble for all the residents, including the Mullings family. The area was nice when we moved there. It's just a particular family. And they made you know that they ran Meridian Walk. Especially late at night when people were trying to sleep, people in the, in the, the neighbours were trying to sleep, they just did not care. At 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock at night, you would see only their house would be busy. I mean, to the point where lights would be on, music would be blaring out. Pirate radio stations, and um, you'd see girls running in and out of the houses, and um, fights outside that involved guns, and you know, you see little children running for their lives because you, to see two grown men fight, even if it's play fighting, it's very scary. They would throw all their drug paraphernalia on the floor, so all the young kids would see either needles or foil wrappers. Um, they would sit there blatantly, you know, smoke what they were smoking in front of young children. And these young guys were supposed to be the little role models for the younger boys that were growing up. Just abuse, swearing, just had no respect. And unfortunately, they, this is what it led to. To protect them from further attacks, the Mullins family have been moved to a hotel. It's close to the hospital. Douglas is still in a critical condition. This is a part that gets really, starts to churn. <laughs> Sometimes you don't know what you're going to, what's going to, what you're going to see, basically. No change in victim condition. It's critical but stable on uh, life support. They were looking at slowly turning the machines off to see if he was self-sufficient and able to support his own uh, life support systems. So uh, at the moment, I, I don't know if they have stopped his... If he does start coming round, um, I mean, it might be 
a miracle, but if he does start coming around and wanting to communicate somehow, that we can get there quickly. If Douglas does survive and can speak, his testimony could be crucial in identifying his attackers. But the Trident team knows this is an outside chance. They compare the statements taken from witnesses, including Douglas's stepdaughter. Natalie, who is somebody that we want to want to speak to today, has got more knowledge of what's going on than anybody, I think, at this stage, because she's the one who's fully aware that at some point this is kicking off and it's going to get worse. Mum and Natalie were still outside the premises, according to Mum, when Natalie turns around and says, Mum, out of the way. She was closer to the gunman than Douglas. His face was covered, he was hooded, and his face was covered from the nose downwards. But she was able to say that he was light-coloured, fair complexion, mixed race, uh, I see three with greeny blue eyes and she said you know I was close enough to see the colour of his eyes and he was cold he fired the shot she turned and saw Douglas falling over put his hand to his head which is remarkable considering the injuries and he said he just walked calmly away. Another witness saw some young men flee from the direction of the gunshot. About two to three minutes later she says she sees a group of six to eight black youths all over 20, somewhere between 20 and 30. She admits she's not very good with age. They're all sort of wearing baggy, dark clothing. But one of them has got uh, this distinctive hat on. It's got the pieces that come over the ears with the tassels on the end, which are hanging down. And she says that one of them in the group states, I'm glad I did that, as directly as she's, uh, they are outside uh, her front garden. And she looks up and she believes that to come from the man with the hat. She would recognise them again and she's willing to go to court. It's only two days since the shooting. Unusually, Trident already has witnesses willing to identify Douglas's attackers. What's more, they'll testify against them. Officers spread the word that anyone involved in the fight must hand themselves in. Within hours, a member of the Meridian crew gives himself up. It's our understanding our information is part of that crowd where uh, missiles were thrown, bricks, etc. And uh, I formally arrested him for conspiracy to murder. The arrested man lives at the address in Meridian Walk, where the gang hung out. Yeah. There is a moral issue here. We've got a man critically ill in the hospital. The prognosis is not good. Hopefully he'll pull through. Um, but clearly, if you've been arrested for conspiracy to uh, conspire with others to commit a murder, fortunately enough at the moment it's not as an attempted murder, then clearly, if you've done nothing wrong, you would like to uh, be your name. The detectives believe the suspect knows more than he is willing to reveal. Right, so we've done the interview. Uh, like pulling teeth to start with, I think he wanted to see what we knew. He you know. says he came out of his house and he's seen the gunman, because as soon as he saw the gun, he's ran away. And when he's run away, he's heard a loud bang. But he knows that we know one of them is on the phone, yeah, so but we won't say who. We wanted him to say who. He wouldn't say who, so we didn't tell him who it was. But it's got him thinking. After a night in custody, the suspect is released on bail while the investigation team gathers more evidence. They need to identify both the masked gunman with the greeny blue eyes and the man who called him in. Seasoned detective DC Kevin Stones makes a major breakthrough. I like to go and tap into the local knowledge uh, of the officers who know the local criminals on their ground and uh, after 20 minutes half hour of running through the computer uh, up popped uh, the face of David Gaynor who you can see has got uh, distinctive greeny blue eyes also went into the intelligence system which um, shows him having access to a red um, rover with the MG kit attached to it. Ten weeks before the shooting, 19-year-old David Gaynor was stopped in a red rover. When approached, he ran away but was caught. A police check revealed he had twice failed to appear in court for possessing an offensive weapon. In the rover at the time, was another man. If we go into the custody imaging. The other person in the car with Gaynor was Simeon Shapush, a suspected drug dealer with a history of violence. When searched, he was found with 850 pounds in cash. 
Simeon Sippers could be interpreted as being Sykes, believed to be the person who called the gunman on. So it's looking good that we've got two good suspects here. If Shapush is Sykes and his blue-eyed friend Gaynor, the gunman, Trident has made a great leap forward. Four days after the shooting, Trident gets another break. Sykes and some of the Meridian crew are spotted. The team plans a raid. From information received from people at the scene, from witnesses and from people who have been uh, interviewed already, certain people um, in that group of six to eight have been identified. Their names mainly are uh, Merrick Hamilton and this male by the name of Sykes. Unfortunately, we don't know anything about this male of Sykes apart from two days ago, he was alleged to be uh, dossing down in a squat, which is where we're going today. The victim, Douglas Mullins, is still in intensive care. His condition is stable but critical, and it's doubtful uh, what his prognosis for the future will be. Strong smell of cannabis inside the house, so we're just going to uh, have a quick chat to him. The squat where Sykes was seen is a safe house used by the Meridian crew. There's intelligence they hid here after the shooting to decide what to do next. Sykes is no longer at the squat, but another member of the Meridian crew is found and taken in for questioning. Police check the flat for items which may link the gang members to the crime. While the search team examines the squat, the arrest team heads for the family address of another gang member. It looks like him with a neck hurt. Open the door, open the door, open the door, please. Come back, I'll fucking bit you. No, it's not. Okay, Lawrence, if you don't come down, I'm going to put the door in, mate. It's a dog, it's a dog, it's a dog. He's come this way. Hurry up, then. Come on! We're giving you plenty of time. Right, coming to the door, man. All right, all right. Hold on. We're going to Stoke Newington Police Station, all right? Trident now has another suspect to interrogate. But there's still no sign of David Gaynor, the alleged gunman. This is from the various witness statements that have been put together. They give, uh... So, is that, unfortunately, there's not much to look for on the uh, clothing front. The detectives believe they've found one of the men who fought with the Mullings family. They hope he'll provide a lead to Gaynor. So, um, we'll see what he's got to say. So he was sleeping with his solicitor's card next to his phone in his bedroom, so um, he was obviously expecting the call and wanting his brief as quickly as possible. The suspects are taken to Tottenham Police Station for questioning. Later that day, they're released on bail. Trident decides to take no further action against those they'd suspected of being involved in the original fight. They concentrate on finding those guilty of the attempted murder. At Edmonton Police Station, another man wanted by Trident gives himself up. During the fight, Merrick Hamilton was spotted handing his phone to Sykes. Hamilton is accompanied by his solicitor and submits a prepared statement. Sykes bumped into a parked vehicle. The owner of the other vehicle started arguing Sykes advised him he was responsible for the damage and he would pay for it. The owner then took out a saw and started to attack Sykes. At no time was I violent towards anyone or abusive to anyone. At no time did I see the gunman. At no time did I state they had knew the gunman or arranged for him to attend. Uh, he elected to make no further comment. A phone has been seized and his SIM card, I understand, was secreted or placed, hidden, whatever you want to call it on top of the architrave of um, the door in the kitchen. Trident has intelligence that Hamilton's phone was used to call the hitman who shot Douglas Mullings. But Hamilton refuses to comment. Without more evidence, police must let him go. At the hospital where Douglas Mullings is being treated, his wife remains at his bedside. It's been very hard when he doesn't open his eyes and when he doesn't make no response. And then I'm wondering what's going on. You know, are there any brain functions? What's going on? And that's when all my kind of fears set in in one respect, you know, because you don't know. And then when I ask him a question and then he might blink, then I know that he's, he's understood what I've said. That's 
that's the highlight for me every day to go and see. Six days after the shooting, Douglas is still in a coma. It's far from certain he will survive. The hunt for his attackers continues. The Trident team gets a lucky break. They have a video of the Red Rover stopped with David Gaynor shortly before the shooting. The same car is spotted by local police. They've also arrested a driver of that car as being suspected of driving that to gunmen to the scene. He's told us where uh, Gaynor is living and also he's given us a phone which has got the number, the telephone number for David Gaynor in it. Now we're hoping that we can prove that this number is a number that was called from Meridian Walk to call him to the scene to carry out that shooting. Using the tip-off from the driver of the Red Rover, that evening police locate David Gaynor at a bail hostel. He's serving a 90-day rehabilitation order for carrying a knife in a public place. Yeah. David, can you take your head down? Yes. They're properly down. I want to see who you are. Gaynor's criminal record began when he was 15. Since then, he has nine convictions for violence, drugs, and possession of an offensive weapon. Sergeant, the brief facts are on the 30th of May 2004, last Sunday, Douglas Mullings, a law abiding family man, was shot in the head in front of his wife and his children. He's currently still alive, he's in a critical condition. And we believe David Gaynor to be responsible for this. Okay, do you understand why you've been arrested? I thought to myself so. Right, it's just a simple yes or no if you understand what the officer said and why you've actually been arrested. That's a yes, yeah? Okay, David, I'm authorising your detention in this police station. Alright, there's a copy of your rights. Police must also give special help to people who have a mental health problem or who suffer from mental illness. Do you need the special help? Do you need help for any other reason? Mm. I just need a couple of signatures off you. One to say that I've given you your rights and one to say that you've requested legal advice. I'm going to authorise the staff to search you to see what property you have. The police have not yet found Gaynor's phone, but they did get his number from the mobile of the driver of the Rover. Phone records may reveal if Gaynor received calls from Merrick Hamilton's mobile on the day of the shooting. The forensic team see that the rover has been thoroughly cleaned recently. But on the passenger door handle, they find a microscopic amount of shotgun residue. It matches the discharge found at the crime scene. At Wembley Police Station, Trident has interviewed David Gaynor twice about his involvement in the shooting. He refuses to comment. He knows that exercising his right to remain silent means he won't incriminate himself. The Trident team needs more evidence to charge Gaynor with the shooting. Otherwise, they'll have to let him go. He's had 36 hours in police custody, which expired at 9.15 this morning. And the way that it works is after someone's been in custody for 24 hours, we can get a superintendent's extension to keep them in custody for another 12 hours um, while the investigation's continuing as quickly as possible. And after that, the only method of, of detaining him further is to go to a magistrate's court and seek, to, seek a warrant of further detention. And that was done this morning. That entitles us to keep him for another 36 hours in police custody. This means we've got to be doing everything as quickly as possible and we can't delay and as soon as we've finished our investigation we have to uh, release him or charge him one or one or the other. If a witness can positively identify Gaynor as the gunman, it may be enough to charge him. So police use video images of Gaynor and eight other men in an identity parade. We've got in there at the moment the partner of the victim and also his daughter. Obviously if it's positive that is extremely good evidence to support us charging the suspect with the attempted murder. I went, went through the first one, it wasn't him, and the second one wasn't him. And when I saw the third one, I said, I said to the man, that's him. I knew I was gonna see him, and I had confidence and faith that Operation Trident caught the right guy. So I was just waiting to see those green cold eyes and that bulging forehead, and I said, yes, 
that's him. He didn't take me up for five minutes. And at that time, his solicitor was in the room and I looked at him to make him know that I've got your man. I was very happy. You know, I positively ID'd him. And to this day, his eyes are still with me, you know. I'm just I'm glad I ID'd him. He's been picked out by the daughter of the victim, who was stood no more than two metres away when he pulled the trigger. To formally charge Gaynor, DI Paul Gapper must get Crown Prosecution Service approval. I'll, I'll, I'll do them two there and then we'll look in the case. If we have to get some more, we'll whack them on later. All right, thanks ever so much, David. Bye, bye. Go for both. Possession with intent to endanger life and also murder, attempt to murder. We're ready when you are. Trident detectives tell Gaynor that he has been picked out as the gunman. He still refuses to answer. But during a cigarette break, he unexpectedly confides in DC Kevin Stones. David, there's a note of something you have said, and I'll read this to you. On Monday, the 7th of June, 2004, whilst taking David Gaynor back to his cell after interview, he asked if he could have a cigarette. I, and that is DC Stones, asked the jailer if he could open the door to the area where people smoke. When in that area, David said to me, you're a good officer, man. I need help. I could give you drug dealers, gun suppliers. I asked him if he knew where Sykes was. He said, how can I trust you? I said, we know he called you on. He said, I just went there to frighten them. I didn't know it was a real gun. The bullets were plastic. It said on the TV, the man was shot in the back of the head. I said, but he, but he is not dead. He said no, but he is going to be with that injury. I asked him where Sykes was, he said, Glendor Avenue. Not uh, all that often that you get somebody who will confess, albeit off, uh, off the record, but it was still a confession. Although I can't use it in evidence in court, it still proves that we've got the right man. And uh, he realises that he's going to go away for a long time. The positive identification is enough for Trident to charge Gaynor with attempted murder. He is remanded in custody. Your mum phoned earlier on. Right? She says she loves you very much and she'll be in touch. Okay? And maybe you can speak to the custody sergeant and get you to speak to you if you want. Maybe in the oh, custody. I don't want to phone her. You don't want to phone her? Why do you want some clothes for tomorrow? Is there anyone can bring some clothes down for you? So yeah, there we have it. Doesn't look such a cold-hearted... Uh, Gunman now, does he? Still, it's a right result, I think. It's a very satisfying moment. So it's the main man now, the gunman, has been caught and charged. There's two others outstanding, but of all the ones to get, this is the one that he'd won. And considering he was unknown at the start of the week, I think we've done phenomenally well. So, yeah, excellent, right, good result. If Douglas doesn't pull through and he dies, obviously the, the charge will just go up on the murder. But I feel good, we know we've got the man. While Gaynor starts the long wait for his trial, Douglas remains in hospital fighting for his life. Although we're just hoping, and I'm hoping that he'll pull through this, I know he won't be the Douglas that I married. And I'm going to have to care for him for 24 hours right around the clock if he survives this and also knowing that he'll probably never be able to work again or even be a father to, to us as a family and as a husband and I think the worst thing is that if he does survive this I'm just so afraid that he may not remember me It's ten days since Douglas was shot the code of silence that has protected so many gunmen is breaking down. David Gaynor has pointed the finger at Sykes as the man who called him in. Trident must act quickly. Sykes is a dangerous man. Are you seeing me? Why are you now? Just nick him, just nick him, Richard. Yeah. Under arrest on suspicion of conspiracy to murder. Do you understand that? What? Yeah. Conspiracy yeah. to murder regarding the shooting that took place a week last Sunday. He won't be harmed, don't worry about him. Alright?
In the house, police find three military-issue bulletproof vests. They also recover the distinctive hat Sykes may have worn during the fight with Douglas Mullings. That's the tray out this. It's all gone well. We'll see what happens back at Edmonton. Unbelievable, Irish's job has gone in about a week and a half. Everyone's been arrested. Yeah, which is good, yeah. Very good. Very mm. unusual, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Mm. Yeah, right. Face the front, please. In a video ID parade, Sykes is positively identified by both Jennifer Mullings and her daughter Natalie. Turn your shoulders so you're facing towards the wall looking at that, please. Sykes refuses to answer any questions but instead chooses to make a written statement. Right, we did the third interview. Started off by just saying he didn't make a phone call to David Gaynor to get him to shoot anyone. I think the witnesses are wrong. There's a whole argument started over me and the accident in the car. Also, I didn't say, come round, bring your stuff. Culturally, I don't speak like that. I generally speak slang. Merrick Hamilton made the call to David Gaynor. He also said, good, I'm glad that was done. So, interestingly enough, he's off in it all on Merrick. That's it. So, give me a call back on my mobile with a CPS decision. You know, I went for a CPS decision as to uh, what to do with you. Susan's come back to charge you with attempted murder. Right, the custody skipper's going to charge you now. Okay, there's one charge against you, which is on the 30th of May 2004, at Meridian Walk N17. You attempted to murder Douglas Mullins. This is contrary to Section 1 of the Criminal Attempts Act 1981. In answer to the charge, you do not have to say anything. It may harm your defence if you do not mention something you later lie in court. Anything you do say will be given in evidence. That's 13.45, no reply. So, I mean, sign here to say that you made no reply. Sign anything wrong. Have we done fingerprints? Do you no, know we have to say. It's the kind of sign, can you? Three, three or six, seven. Sykes has his solicitor present. So you been to go with his officers? You're going to get your... The evidence is quite strong against Sykes. He's been picked out twice. It's a very clear-cut case from our perspective that uh, he's a man that's made the phone call to, uh, to the gunman, to Gaynor, to come down um, to shoot Mullins. It was Hamilton's phone that uh, appears to have been used. Both Shapush and Hamilton were, were together. They were both very excited, very aggressive. They were uh, cutting their air through hand movements and, and gun fingers were going on as if they were threatening, your, you know, your man's going to get it, as if intimating that he was going to get shot. It's quite clear that Hamilton's got a part in this and uh, we'll wait and see how much of a part he had. Right, I'll take it, you've got, you've got a uniform, uniform car playing eyeball on it, have you? Two weeks later, DS Richard Davis is on the trail of two suspects who've been in hiding since the shooting. They were in the stolen Mercedes as it drove away from Meridian Walk. The Trident team fears they may have the shotgun used against Douglas. Well, I've got reason to believe, right, that you're concerned yeah, in the shooting it. of Douglas Mullins on the 30th of May. Okay? Uh, uh, the shop, so if you were driving a Mercedes, which is stolen. Yeah, that day, okay? Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to nick you now. Okay, yeah. Alright, and then we're going to go back to speak to the police station. So I'm going to formally arrest you, alright, for a conspiracy to murder, violent disorder, and uh, theft of a Mercedes motor vehicle. The vehicle that you're in, yeah, we're going to search that. That's not going to do with it, bro. That, 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 that is, that is, is my car. I, I might stand in a firearm from the, from the shooting, okay? Okay, okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to search your car. Okay. I'm going to search your address. All right, so uh, at the moment... Can I just ask no, one question? No phone calls, I'm going to detain both of the people. Okay, can I just ask one question? Yeah, sorry, what, what's, this got to do what, what's, what's your name? The young woman was with the suspects when stopped. They admit they've been to her house, which is nearby. Probably got nothing to do with you whatsoever. Unfortunately, because you're with them and because they've been to your house today, I'm going to search it. I haven't been to those premises. You just said you had two seconds ago. No, I said I was outside of those premises. I haven't been inside you. Ask your mum if I have set foot in those premises. I have not. I've not set foot in those premises. Right. She's now said that she was in the Mercedes, which turned out which had the accident initially on the day, which sparked up a whole thing. And we're not going to arrest her at this stage, um, as we can't, as we don't think her involvement goes beyond being the girlfriend of uh, one of the boy people there, really. So, so now we're just going to take her up to the address and we're going to start searching as all is organised. Um, and that's it and hopefully we might find a firearm. Police can find no weapons in the car, but DS Richard Davis wants to search the girls' home because the arrested men have been there. 
The girl's mother and sister are outside. Are you happy with her connections with these people? Or no. You're not at all? Didn't know, I knew he was a bit blooming slippery, but I didn't know, like, how bad. I think she's scared of him. The so way she's acted with me, yeah, it was like she awful. was being pressurised. I went through her drawers and found little wraps of something, mm-hmm. whatever that was. I don't know what it was. Um, so, like, it could only have been him. We'll do. We're going to search your house. Yeah. Um, you can come in with us. Obviously, we'll just leave one if that's feasible because we don't get too many people up in there when we start searching. And, and, and your house. Like, so I'm, a bed where it's against the wall. They pull it out. She's made a hole. So the hole underneath of the bed is just space. Is that where she keeps the stuff, is it? Did you tell me? This is the bedroom. And um, in here, under the bed, they found that appears to be a, a silver handgun, silver revolver with black taped handle. And so she's been arrested on suspicion of uh, possession of a firearm. The dog has shown a lot of interest in this room, but in, in particular, of course, it's uh, sniffed around a lot not next door. And it's shown a lot of attention to that bottom corner there and the floorboard underneath it. But the dog's had a good sniff and it, it quite likes a lot of it around here. So uh, I don't know if firearms have been here regularly or it's just on the odd occasion. So I don't know whose room this is at present, but certainly we're going to call on our specialist search team and they can do the whole bit to make sure we don't miss anything. The search team does not find any other firearms. The gun found under the mattress is an imitation. The two arrested men are released without charge, but the team makes an unexpected find. What looks to be 16 kilos of cocaine. The girl, her mother, and a lodger are all arrested for possession of the cocaine. <laughs> Can I quickly see him? Because I swear to God, this is out of order. He's been such a prick keeping me and my mum in here for no reason. It's out of order. Weirdo, I hate that little shrimp. You had him in your possession a large quantity of cocaine. The amount of drugs that are recovered are in the region of £500,000. The defendant is quite clearly financing his lifestyle through the supply of controlled drugs. From the circumstances and what the officer has told me, okay, I'm not going to grant bear in this matter. Understand? Yeah. If you'd like to go with this officer now, and he will take your photographs, okay? Yeah. Probably. Probably. My client in the interview has given her full account to the officers. And she knows nothing about the drugs. The drugs were not found in her room. <laughs> yes, she leaves within the household. I don't even go in the room that the drugs are found in. <laughs> there is nothing to suggest that you've granted bail in relation to these matters. She will fail to surrender. I've been bailed before and I turn it up. It's not like I'm not going to turn up. She's only 18 years of age. Of previous good character. <laughs> I've listened to what the officer has to say and I've listened to what the, the, your solicitor has got to say and my decision is that I'm not going to grant you bail. Just you can do anything. If, if you have to put a tag on me, anything. You may not turn up at court tomorrow. I will turn up. Because of the serious nature of the I will the, turn up. You can do anything. I promise on my lease and lease's life I will turn up. All right. <laughs> I can't like, stay in there, you know. I guarantee you that I'll turn up at court. Well, I'm going to ensure that you, you do. All right, and that means you'll stay here tonight. Okay. Police drop the charges against the girl and her mother when Philip Hadley accepts responsibility for the drugs. He's sentenced to eight and a half years in prison. The girl admits to being in the gold Mercedes when it dented Douglas Mullins's car, but she was not involved in the fight or the shooting. Phone records show that shortly before the shooting, three calls were made from Merrick Hamilton's phone to the alleged gunman. Witnesses say that Sykes actually made the calls, but it's enough evidence to charge Hamilton as well. The trial for the attempted murder of Douglas Mullings will involve Hamilton and three other accused. David Gaynor, believed to be the assassin. Simeon Shapush, known as Sykes, who allegedly ordered the assassination attempt and the suspected driver of the car that Gaynor travelled in. Four charged, a nice little trial looming. At the moment, all we had on Gaynor was identification evidence about him being picked out as a gunman. 
A search was done on Gaynor's home address and a load of photos were recovered. There's some nice little shots here. There's two uh, A4 shots of David Gaynor shoving a, uh, what appears to be a, a semi-automatic pistol down the waistband of his trousers and holding it up in the, uh, the usual uh, dissing tone. So it's very clearly David Gaynor's face on that. It just shows really the mentality of these as uh, extremely naive, really, to think that they should have these things as uh, mementos of their uh, bad guy image and think that they can, you know, quite happily get away with that, which is fine, I suppose, showing their mates and uh, large in it until they get caught and then it gets used as evidence against them because it's quite damning as regards character. Associates of Gaynor and the other suspects remain a threat to the Mullingses. Whatever happens to Douglas, Jennifer and the family won't return to live in Meridian Walk. The evidence given by Mrs Mullings and her family is quite crucial and obviously the police cannot mount an operation outside their house for umpteen weeks, months or, or however long it takes. So in the interest of the family it's essential that they do get moved to a location which is secret because if somebody is convicted of the attempted murder on her husband people can come back and seek revenge. The family is given a safe house in another part of the country. DC Del Hadi protects Jennifer while she prepares for the move. This is not fair because we didn't do anything. Our whole world was changed upside down. Losing my home, my friends, my neighbours that we got on so well with. My son's school. You don't get schools where you can work with a headmaster and teachers the way that we did. We all worked well together. The doctors, everything. It's just a big change. Put so much into this place. Put so much into it. And the ironic thing, just in the last month, so much decorating. Everything. And now we won't be able to enjoy it. While Jennifer packs, DC Haddie spots a cousin of Merrick Hamilton's. The Trident detective yeah, the, hopes the young man yeah, might give evidence against Sykes. I don't want to prove my cousin's innocence. You, get what I'm saying. you probably know more about it than what I do, what went on to get the gunman, because the gunman wasn't part of the argument going up and down here. He was called in, wasn't he, to do the deed. You know who made the phone call. You know whose phone was used. Yeah. Like, we all know who that is, and we're like, Hamilton didn't make the phone. Mm -hmm. So which one do you think it was then? I don't know. I, 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 you just I, said I, you I, did know. Yeah, yeah. I, just, I know that it ain't Hamilton. You get what I'm saying, like. Well, if it's not Hamilton, then who was it? I don't. I don't know, man. I don't want to say. You know, is <laughs> that's incriminating? But well, sometimes when you when you're looking after your family and your friends, uh, sometimes it's it's time to stand up and say, "Well, not my cousin. It's it was somebody else." Oh, I don't know. I don't know now. Now, if somebody was going to sit down and tell us everything from the beginning to an end. Um, it might help people. I mean, you might be the man to do that. <laughs> it's dangerous living in a street, isn't it? You get killed just for having a little argument over. Well, you don't get killed, you get hurt. He's not dead, though, isn't he? No, he's, he's very badly injured. Is, is, he, is, he, is he normal now? No, no, no he's, he never will be uh, Douglas the way he was, no. Three months later, and six months since the shooting, Jennifer still visits Douglas in hospital. He's improving. You catch the bus every day to uh, the hospital then? Yeah, I do the journey all every day. Sometimes it can be an hour, an hour yeah. and a half, depending. On the time of day? Yeah, on the time of day. Douglas can now sit up and speak. Before the trial, DI Paul Gapper goes to see if he remembers the day he was shot. He could be the most important witness of all. If anything means to you that we're annoying him, which I annoy a lot of people anyway, yeah. Jennifer, all the time, so... But, uh, it, it's not heavy today. We're not going into detail. It's just more so the boss can have an assessment in his own mind what he's going to talk to the Crown Prosecution Service tomorrow about his current position. Douglas, what caused your injury? How did that happen? My head. Yeah. How did that happen? Before the shot. Before the shot. He said to me, apologize, apologize before. I said, how, how, how me to, to apologize? You match my car, me to, to apologize. 
all right, all right. You're dead now. He said, he said that. Yeah, he said to me, you're dead. He, he, the man he, with the plaque said that. Yeah, he said, you're dead now. And he's he, 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 he mobile, he mobile, and he called him, he called him, and he, he got him. And see, and see, and I think that's enough for today. You done. You've done very well. I'm sorry, very, very, very but well. it, it, it's sometimes it's get to me and mm. it, it, of course it, it does. bothers you. I can yeah. understand that. Yeah, I will try to speak when when I can. Okay, mm -hmm. do that. Thank you, Douglas. We got to a point where he has trouble when you ask him a question. Obviously, with his, uh, the damage to his head, he has trouble processing the, the hearing of it and then thinking about the question and then replying. You can almost feel the frustration of him seeing what he wants to say and not being able to say it. But today's interview was for that purpose, to see how good his memory was and he is getting better. Uh, initially, we thought he was going to die then we thought he was going to be semi-brain dead, but still alive. I never thought I'd see him in the state that he is today. Although I can't emphasise enough, he is still a very, very sick man. Does Douglas actually ask you or when it's all going to get better? Has he ever sort of indicated to you that he's thinking ahead at all? There are times when he, you know, he, he does because um, he will ask and, you know, like he asks the nurse, will I ever walk? He'll ask them, you know, in his way. It would take him ages to get there in his, uh, you know, asking questions, but would he be able to walk again, talk, you know, and, that, and at that early point they couldn't tell him anything and, you know, it was a bit it hard. It probably troubles him and he can't obviously yeah. express himself. Yeah. He says it's all there. He, he knows what he wants to say. Yeah. But it doesn't quite come out. Come out. I am not going to subject Douglas to the stress and strain of a court procedure, but it's a time when we depend on the witnesses to come out and come forward, to break down that wall of silence, to not be afraid. They have to stand in the witness box and face the people that they are accusing and say what they saw. Seven months after the shooting, the trial by jury begins at the Old Bailey. It's the moment of truth for Trident, the Mullings family, and the accused. Even at this stage, they seem unaware of what deep trouble they're in, and they believe in their invincibility. They're, they're there, when the judge goes out, they start pushing each other and laughing and joking. And it's, it's sometimes a bit shocking to see that, and you think, well, why, why can't you see what you've done? You know, and look at what, look what's, what's in front of you. If they get convicted, all their freedom is gonna be gone. This doesn't seem to be dawning on them. Along with the photographs found at Gaynor's home, Trident presents another piece of evidence to the court. Gaynor wrote a song that seems to be about shooting Douglas. The first line is, I'll, I'll kill you in front of your family. It's very difficult to sort of understand how someone can be so callous and what sort of frame of mind they must be to, to do that. It's like a contract has been paid to do it, but in this case I don't think there was any money ever being paid, it's just gang culture. And the gangster rap seems to be part and parcel of this culture singing about murders and gun crime and drugs, being photographed, videoed with, with guns and, and it's shown to be an acceptable and hero worship face of society, but that's, you know, that's fine to do. This is what you get if you're a big man. Life is cheap for uh, that sort of people, I suppose. Never have I ever dreamt that I'd ever be in a place such as the Old Bailey, but this is where five seconds or a minute of madness had taken me and my family. My son, still asking me why. Why, Mummy? Why did this happen? And I just haven't got the answers to give him at this stage. I know it's a long process that we're going to have to go through, but will justice be done? Because at the end of the day, Douglas has got a life sentence anyway. But the only thing I can do is go through the system, trust it at this stage, and see if it works for us, really and just pray that justice will be done. A week after the start of the trial, it's time for Jennifer to give evidence. You got butterflies? Yeah. The second you start your evidence, 
your ability to judge time will disappear. If you're in there an hour or two hours or three hours, it'll go just like that, it really does. All you've got to do is remember the truth. Don't allow them to suggest you saw something different. Completely you different. You saw something. Yeah. You saw it in the story. Yeah. Definitely. I feel that if witnesses were protected, as we have been, people would be more willing to say something because I'm sure there were many people that wanted to be witnesses but were in fear of what could happen to them. And there's got to be a real clear message given to these young boys that they will not get away with it. If you walk with a gun or a knife, your intent is to use it. And I know we've got a big fight in front of us, but we're not going to let them get away with it. Jennifer's daughter is a key witness for the prosecution. She's determined to give evidence against those accused of attacking her stepfather. I hate every single one of them and I want them to know that and I'm not scared of them either. I hate every single one of them for what they've done. I wish they rot in hell. And to be honest, prison's too good for them. I should bring back the death penalty, eye for an eye. That's what I really feel. They called up this man so callously and so evil like they were you know, ordering a pizza, that's how it is to me. So, you know, you have a, a, a hitman on speed dial. This boy decided he was going to show his street cred, you know, like he's one of them gangsters, I'll, I'll sort it out. And he can ask himself, when he looks in the mirror, what does he see? Because I see an evil, callous, cold-hearted man. For seven months, Gaynor has made no comment to the charge. Early in the trial, he makes a major change to his plea of not guilty. So now he's admitting presence, he's admitting being a gunman, but he disputes an attempted murder stating uh, that he didn't aim at Douglas Mullins and he didn't believe it to be a real bullet or cartridge. So um, I don't really know how that defence is going to stand up with the evidence that's against him. But he he's obviously thinks the weight of evidence against him being there was too great to contest and it would make him out to uh, be too much of a liar in front of a jury. This doesn't lessen the ordeal of attending court for Jennifer. But the most difficulties that I had in, in, in court today was just to see Douglas standing there, hearty, you know, a strong man, with his hands on his side, and, and, and now he's really frail. It's not until it happens to you or somebody close to you that you realise, mm -hmm. and it's not just Douglas who's been there. If you think that you've lost your job, Douglas has lost any hope of uh, working again. Working again. Um, and obviously you've got a life to get on with, you've got a young family, you've got to feed them, clothe them, and all this for a moment of madness. Three weeks into the trial, and after eight months in hospital, Douglas returns home. Though well enough to be discharged, he still can't manage on his own. The burden of his care falls on Jennifer. I, I love I love to home again. I love to home again. In the hospital, I said, Jennifer, please, what is that for me? What's happened to me? He used to say, what's happened to me? He's, le he's lost the left field of his vision and the hearing. When I took him out for a walk one day in the wheelchair when he couldn't talk and he was drooling and just trying to give him some fresh air and I noticed something in the top of his head that was glistening and I asked one of the nurses if they could have a look and she said yes it's one of the pellets and I took that out on the 31st of the 9th 04 at 2.35 they took that out and gave it to me and he's got quite a few of those still in the brain which I can't take out. I can show you. Yeah. Okay. He's got that bit to go as well, where they're going to have to go back and, and put the, the, the bone, the bone flap in, because you can literally see the brain just pumping, and they're going to have to protect the, they want to protect actually the, the, the brain matter, what's left there, so they're going to call it a bone flap to go back in the head, to cover the brain back inside. Try not to poke it, because sometimes it might scratch and so on. Sometimes, like, soft, it's soft. Right? It's soft. I'm not looking forward to court tomorrow to see these are the people that have caused pain. Pain that they wouldn't even imagine, neither their family, neither their parents, 
none of them would know just to, just to, just to go there. Because for one, I don't know if they, they have any remorse, if they felt that they'd done anything wrong. I don't know the mindset of them, I just don't know the mindset of them. The trial continues for another four weeks. The defendants start to accuse each other. Shapush Sykes continues to claim that Merrick Hamilton called Gaynor to kill Douglas. Gaynor, while in detention, accused Sykes of calling him. But in court, he refuses to name Sykes for fear of retribution. The jury retires to consider who's telling the truth. It's been swings and roundabouts for Douglas for the last two weeks, really, and then coming up to the last week of this trial has been very hard because he just can't understand why I'm going back again and again and again and just trying to explain to him that the jury's out and he seems to have a concept of that and oh you know and he keeps on saying it doesn't matter it doesn't matter and I said to him well, why it's done all already that's all he said it's all, it's all been done all already it doesn't matter and nothing can change me just forgive them sometimes I said just forgive them. They never know, know, know what they're doing. You know? It's hard. It's hard to forgive them. But God, please, please, please forgive them. The jury finds Simeon Sapush, known as Sykes, guilty of attempted murder. He is sentenced to 25 years. Merrick Hamilton is found not guilty of attempted murder, but guilty of threats to kill. He receives three years. The jury decides that the man arrested in the Red Rover played no part in the shooting. David Gaynor is found guilty of attempted murder. He is sentenced to 25 years in prison. Did he honestly think he was going to get away with it? That's what I can't understand. I just can't understand. Mm. Yeah. 25 years for one. It's hard, but... And 25 years for the other. And three for one. It's not an easy thing to go into court and give evidence. Some parts I found them um, to be very difficult, like looking at the exhibits, photographs of blood stain and then seeing Douglas outside. A hearty, strong man. Douglas isn't the same person. They never want to fight. When he started to, to, to like them was trying to like them was hurt me. They wanted to hurt me. And I, and and he come up my face and he said, apologize. Apologize. And I said to him, how oh, can I apologize? And you mash up my car. Huh? You want me just to say no, to say apologize to you? Apologize, apologize. And he said, you're mad. No more guns! No more blood! No more guns! No more blood! No more 